welcome back to Spiritual Uplift, 30 Days of Encouragement from the Summerdale Church of Christ. As you can tell, I'm still uh, in the bunker <laughs> because of COVID quarantine and um, want to share with you our message today. We're going through a series on joy. Uh, you can tell I don't, I don't feel all that well, so it's hard to teach and preach about joy when you just kind of, you're struggling, but that's really what this series is about. It's about recognizing that there is joy in everything. There's joy in any situation, anything that we're going through. And we know that God is truly good no matter what. And that's a positive way to look at life. We will spend time the next few weeks in a series here at Summerdale on James 1 verses 2 and 3, where it talks about uh, having a joy that it, it comes from trials and from testing. He says, count it all joy when you face these various things. So it's, it's important for us to see that we can find joy in all things. And even in the tough stuff, there is there are moments when we know that God is with us. So uh, as we share our thought from today, I'm going to be in Isaiah 40 and verse 31. And I chose to wear my snook shirt today because uh, the Eagles are our mascot. And this is the theme verse, uh, I guess you'd say the mission statement verse for the school. It's written on the walls. The kids have memorized it. Uh, and it reminds us of what God does with his people. It says here in Isaiah 40 and 31, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wigs like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Man, isn't that great? I love that passage. It's probably one of my favorite in the Old Testament, top five at least. It used to be my very favorite verse in the Old Testament. But it reminds us, Isaiah is saying, this is what happens when you walk in a mature walk with God. Uh, I want you to notice that it, it kind of goes in a different order than you might think. You usually we think about um, starting off in a walk and then kind of getting ourselves up to a run and then taking flight. Uh, but this is the opposite. Um, eagles can soar very high. They can soar above the storms. They can soar above, uh, you know, the clouds, everything. They can get way, way up there and see down below. They can get high above all the storms in their life. This particular uh, lesson that I want us to think about together today is having joy and patience. The joy of patience. The joy of waiting. Uh, there are many times that I have burned my mouth eating cookies, eating a slice of pizza right out of the oven because I like it hot. I don't like my food cold. Ironically, I like my coffee cold, but for whatever reason, uh, I don't like I don't like anything lukewarm. I like it either hot or cold. I'll eat cold pizza, but I just don't like lukewarm pizza. And so uh, there are times that when we, we like things a certain way, we'll do anything we can to get it. And we forget that sometimes if we'll just wait a little bit, just a little bit, God has something else in store for us. There are several stories in Scripture that remind us about individuals who have had joy and patience. One is Noah. I can't imagine. I know we talk a lot about Job. We'll deal with him in a few weeks uh, or in a totally different lesson. But the joy of patience is seen in Noah. Noah built that ark for years. It was his labor. But to him, it was a, an ark of safety. He built that ark not just for the animals. And remember, Hollywood has a wonderful way of portraying these things. And we kind of get wrapped up into those stories. But from reading Genesis 6 uh, and through 8, it's pretty clear that, that Noah wanted to build the ark as a place of safety for he and his family. Uh, he uh, encouraged others to join. Uh, it says he's a preacher of righteousness. And no doubt while he was hammering away on this giant boat in the middle of nowhere, uh, people are coming up and teasing him and, and, and asking him what he's doing. They think he's just this crazy old man that's out here building this giant box in the middle of the desert or in the middle of the wilderness. And so uh, they, they don't follow him. They don't listen to him. Uh, and that's tough. It's tough when you feel like uh, you're doing the right thing, you've chosen the right path, and nobody else has listened to you. And I think most of us can probably attest to the fact that we've been through certain things in our life where we've been extremely patient. And we get angry. We get frustrated saying, God, why, why aren't you hearing me? Why aren't you listening to me? And he's saying, just be still. Be still and know that I am God. Noah understood that. And he builds that ark. He does it. He was a good man. He was a faithful man. He was dedicated to God. Uh, he recognized that he wanted to be saved. His family wanted to be saved. And along with it, God sends the animals to be saved, which he becomes the caretaker of them for over a year. 
And what a way to tell the story. It just kind of fast forwards through uh, most of that within a chapter time to see what's going on, chapter and a half of what's going on as they enter the boat. Uh, there's something else that I always think is, is uh, very alarming. Um, whenever Moses gets the animals inside the boat and the rain begins to fall, it says, and God shut the door. Uh, it's alarming to me because I know Noah is a human. And he has children. No doubt he's expecting to have grandchildren. And I can't imagine the cries outside that ark, um, the weeping of friends and maybe even family members that are outside that, that door that just want to get in. And he's given them plenty of time. God gave him the warning to give to the people. And it says God shut the door. The door was closed. And it wasn't just closed for uh, to keep the, the, the people that were going to reach their eternal destination as a result of their uh, life of sin. But he kept the door closed for the safety of the eight faithful ones. And so Noah had to spend quite a bit of time being patient on that ark until he got to um, experience the, the, the rain going away and eventually knowing that there was dry land and being able to, he doesn't really park the ark. He's, he's, he didn't build it. It doesn't seem with any functions. I think it's funny. I was looking at an ark one time, maybe at a Lifeway bookstore, and it's got this uh, ship turning wheel and rudder and everything with it so you can play with it in the bathtub. I was like, yeah, I don't think there was any way to maneuver this thing. It was just a big floating box, and God kept them safe inside until it was time to get off that ark. So he had to have patience for a long time, building it a long time in it, and then coming out of the ark. He makes a few mistakes, no doubt, like any human does, but he learns to have joy and, and patience. He saved his family. Another one's David. We talk a lot about David. David had great patience. He dealt with some personal struggles with his family. He dealt with struggles with his children, especially. Uh, he had issues with his best friend's dad, which was Saul. King Saul was the father of Jonathan, his best friend. He had problems with them. He had problems with the Philistines. He had problems with the, uh, the, the enemies that he faced. He even faced a lot of uh, harshness from individuals within the circle he had, his, his other fellow friends and kings and rulers. Um, and he, he faced hardship throughout his entire, it seems to be, through most of his kingship. He was a man of valor, though. He would go out and he would fight on the battlefield. The one chance that he has to go and doesn't. We, we know what happens there with the sin of Bathsheba. But, but David is one who learned. If he was good, if he was faithful, if he was dedicated, if he served uh, God, he knew he would be saved just like Noah. Um, and I also want to point out another Old Testament character that maybe you don't think of when you think of patience. And that's uh, Joseph. Joseph was extremely patient. His brothers turned on him. They threw him in a pit. He comes up out of the pit. Uh, Genesis 41 tells us a little bit about, about the story and all through all the way to chapter 50 that it plays out that his, his, his brothers end up uh, coming to meet him, that he's disguised himself. He doesn't look like uh, an Israelite. He looks like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. He walks like an Egyptian. You know, you get it. So the idea is at this point, He's really basically an Egyptian. He's, he's given up a lot of his ways when it comes to his Israelite heritage. And so his brothers come to town. Um, he, he tests them a little bit by taking one of the brothers and putting him in prison. <clears throat> but, the, but the gist of the story is he forgives them for them throwing him into prison. And, of course, he has the problems with Potiphar, and he has the problems in the jail. And it seems like there's, there's all these issues going back and forth. But he was extremely patient. He knew from the very beginning from the verse visions he had, that God was going to use him to do something magnificent, and he had to have patience. I mentioned Job. We'll talk about him in the future. Job's a great one as an example of patience. Jesus, what a great example of patience to, to give him his life 30 years before he starts his ministry. He stays with his mother uh, and his stepfather, Joseph, which is really cool how that scenario plays out. He ends up taking on his stepfather's business. Joseph ends up teaching him the trade of being carpenter. And then uh, he has some issues with his brothers and sisters as well. Moving on into his ministry, Pharisees hated him. Sadducees hated him. He had to have extreme patience to deal with them all the way up to the cross where he could look down off the cross and say, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then I think about the early Christians. 
Um, it broke my heart yesterday. I got an email, um, or it wasn't an email, it was an inbox message on Facebook. There is a, a small circle of preachers that have done missions or have supported missions in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And I, I got the message yesterday, it was yesterday, um, that the church that was meeting in secret in Kabul, uh, Kabul, uh, that they were executed on Friday night. And they had met in secret. They were told not to meet, but people knew where the Christians were. Uh, and as the story plays out, I don't, I don't have it with me, but um, as the story plays out, apparently the mother of the home had called the lady who was the church meeting in her home, called uh, another missionary friend and kept them on the phone and said that her, her daughters had said, you know, we will not denounce Christ, her little girls. And, um, and so they were all executed and they believed that was the last of the, the, the Christians that members of the church that were there in, in that particular part of the region. And it breaks my heart to think about the persecution that they have to go through. Um, it's, it's unbelievable how spoiled, I'm going to use that word, uh, that we are. It's almost reckless with the way we expect uh, the world to treat us and others to treat us, that we should have everything we want, that we should get all of our desires. And that's just not basic Christianity. Christianity is about serving. It's not being served. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to serve. Being a faithful Christian means being patient. Our reward, we get small ones here on the earth, but our reward is coming one day. And I've heard people say, well, I'm going to get a star on my crown. You know, I'm going to get a robe. I'm going to get a mansion. I'm going to get streets of gold. You know, I, I could care less about those things, to be honest. I've been poor before. I know what that's like. I've, I've gone without, and that's fine. I, I don't need the mansion. It'd be nice to have one. <laughs> I'm not going to complain if I get the keys. I'm sure whatever I get, it'll be equal with everybody else. But whatever God chooses to give me is wonderful. I just want to go to heaven and be with God. I want to be able to look Jesus in the face eye to eye. I want to see his uh, reflection. I want to see his His image. I want to um, say thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. The the patience that he had not to sin, to not make a mistake, to stay faithful to the, to the plan until the end. Uh, even in his prayer in the garden, as he says, it's not my will but yours to be done, Father. That that rocks me to my soul sometimes. That he says, I am willing to forego my emotions to stand firm on the truth of the will of God, of the plan of God. Because even, even though he's he's fully God, he's also fully man. And those those human emotions, the flesh cries out. And you say, Well, I don't understand how the flesh cries out. Yeah, you do. You just you just don't think of it like this. When you're hungry, something happens in your stomach. Whenever you're thirsty, your mouth gets dry. Whenever you're tired and you're exhausted, your body relaxes. And when you're stressed, you may have a headache. You know what those things are, right? That's the flesh speaking to you. Uh, your eyesight gets dim. Your, your ears begin to kind of fog up a little bit and you can't hear like you used to. Our sense is dull. We fall more often, more frequently as we get older. And that's what this psalm, or pardon me, this this uh, message from Isaiah 40 is really all about. It's something that we see in the ministry of Jesus. It's something that we see in the lives of these individuals I've mentioned, like Job and, and, and Joseph and Noah and even of David. That we start off in our faith walk with God on, plan, on cloud nine. I mean, we are, we're so excited to be able to be a Christian. We want to tell everybody. We want to share the message of hope with as many people as we can. We get our Bibles out. We get our, our notes out. We get we take notes in sermons, and we're, and we're making notes in our Bible, and we're just so excited. We're on fire for the Lord, telling people about salvation, how we became saved. But then, as time goes by and we mature, we realize that we, not, not to dull our faith, not to diminish our faith, but sometimes we've got to slow down a little bit and not be so reckless in the way that we, we treat people. Uh, we begin to, in love, teach the truth. We find open doors. We look for doors of opportunity. We don't just run out and, and, and just start teaching every single person. That's something that we love to do when we're young. But as we get older, 
uh, we need to be in our mature ways finding specific places to go and specific people. The best evangelism is done through relationships. And I think that's that center part of this. We start off on wings like eagles, and then we begin to run the Christian race. And we realize that it's not a marathon. Uh, it's, not, it's not something where I'm trying to get in first. You know, it's not a sprint to the end. It's just simply being able to keep a goal, a task in mind, and move towards it. Uh, I, used to, I used to hate playing soccer when I was a kid, but I played soccer. It was, it was all right. My friends were fun, but I, my mom said that I would, I would lay down on the grass and just look at the sky because I was a, a forward or I was a guard uh, on, the, on the backside there um, guarding the goal. And, and our kids were so good up front uh, that ball never came to our side. And I would sometimes just lay down. I was kind of bored out of my gourd. As I got older and I started coaching soccer, soccer is a busy sport. The ball is moving, usually on both sides of the court if the teams are evenly matched. And I thought, I thought that, that soccer was a boring sport for a long time. And then when I played it, and, and as I got older and I, my kids played it, I realized it's really active. Um, but like with football, for instance, after every play, they kind of reassemble each other, and they get, a, get another play, and then they move. And it, it, it takes a little bit of a slower pace. And so therefore, the, the players and the coaches have to be ready every single play to try to predict what the defense is going to do and to run a certain drill or run a certain play to be able to score or at least get forward and make a first down. And our coach used to always run the ball. He ran the ball a lot. He didn't like to throw, even though we had a great quarterback that could throw the ball. He wanted us to he said, I want you to run it up their gut. You know, just keep running, keep running, keep running. And we, we knew at least um, the, usually the first play was always a run play. And uh, if we had made a little bit of progress, the third down play was always a run play. You weren't afraid to go for it on fourth. And so uh, we realized that you have to stop and assess. And you think about the defense. You think about the guys around you. You're running new players in. And it's, it's a very complicated process. And so you don't want to go extremely fast and running. And, you know, no huddle works for some people. But um, for our coach, it was all about making sure everybody was in their places and doing what they were assigned to do. And so I see that taking place here. In our maturity, we begin to carefully plot and plan uh, the steps of faith that we need to take. And then the last step there, obviously, is walking with the Lord hand in hand. As we grow older, we learn the value of taking time to smell the roses. And walking is really how you allow people to catch up to you in your spiritual walk. Because you're going to have people around you as you get older that... They're going to need wisdom. You have it to impart. And so you take the time to sit down and visit and talk. And this may be a great time to point out to younger Christians, seek a mentor, seek a couple of mentors that will share their faith with you, their story. Uh, I love history today. No doubt in my mind, I love history because I love spending time with my grandparents. And even when my grandmother was at work in the summer, I'd walk across the street and hang out with the neighbors. Yeah, they were old enough to be my grandparents too. I would go over there and I'd sit down. Sometimes they'd have little cookies. You know, you get like a, 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 a Sadie's pecan, you know, things. Or you might get a, a you know, um, some of those little circus peanuts, you know, that they had. And maybe a diet right or something. Um, but we would always sit down. We'd have a conversation. And I would listen to their stories. I would drive my bike over to my grandpa's house. We live in the same town. And I would just sit on his couch and listen to him tell stories and read the Bible and talk about things. And it just, it fascinated me. And I think that's why I love history. I love spending my time around people that were in the military, hearing their, their battle stories. That is just really neat to hear what people have had to go through to share their message. And that's where you start the walking portion is that you start off, man, you're flying, you're excited, you're, you're just ecstatic and that passion, that zeal, but then you funnel it. And you begin to kind of hone it in and you start running that Christian race. And then when you get tired and you start to wear down, don't lay down. You walk with the Lord and you'll not faint when you do those things and you follow according to his plan. There is joy in patience. My question to you is, will you wait on the Lord? Will you be patient and let God have his work in your life? You're a work in progress. Philippians talks a little bit about this. Paul deals with it in several of his books. But he, he, he tries to tell them that God is working in you. He's working in you. He's working through you. 
Romans 8 deals with that a little bit. Paul understood maybe more than a lot of other people in the first century because he'd experienced such a terrible life of sin. He didn't see it as that. He was very zealous for what he believed before his conversion. But it was clear as time went by that he needed to, to understand a message of grace. And he learned about the patience of God because God was long-suffering towards him. Sometimes we learn forgiveness when someone is forgiving to us. And we learn patience and long-suffering when we have a relationship with someone who shows that to us. So be the person, that, the better person, that is patient and listens, you're kind, you're understanding, that brotherly kindness comes in, and you just, I'm here for you, whatever you need. Don't run headlong into problems and struggles. Walk with the Lord, run, fly, whatever it takes, uh, wherever you are in your spiritual walk. And sometimes that may happen uh, a couple of times. You may be renewed with energy. We'll talk about revival in uh, a few weeks. Learn to practice patience. It's a great virtue. Wait on the Lord and he will renew your strength. How awesome is that? What a great message from the word of God. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. Make it a great day today. I hope you have a wonderful experience wherever you're going, whatever you're doing. Uh, go let God do great things through you and share a message of hope with the world. Hope to see you again here next time on Spiritual Uplift.